to this episode of Military History Inside Out, presented by War Scholar. Today I speak with John Wukovitz, who's written a book on Notre Dame chaplains who served in World War II. He goes, he, he's gone through um, hundreds of their letters and other writings uh, to put together a story, very fascinating story about uh, what they went through in World War II on all the various fronts. So, um, this will be a very interesting episode uh, with a lot of human stories. And um, so, thank you and enjoy. I'm speaking with John Wukovitz, author of Soldiers of a Different Cloth, Notre Dame Chaplains in World War II. Uh, thank you for speaking with me. Well, it's a pleasure, Chris. Uh, anytime I have someone interested in uh, the topic of this book, it's sure something I like to take advantage of. So uh, thank you for the invitation. Oh, yeah. So first, tell me, how did you get into studying and writing on this topic? Well, I've been writing World War II history for 25 years, 30 years. Um, the last half of that, the books. And um, a few years back, I'm, I'm a graduate of Notre Dame, and a few years back I re was reading a history of Notre Dame. I'm one of those history nerds who can read almost anything, obviously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm reading that for pleasure, right? <laughs> and um, it was written in 1948. The author mentioned that during World War II, there were 30-some chaplains from Notre Dame, uh, and that maybe someday someone will write their story. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah, I'll be happy to if they did something. You know, if they're all stateside posts, that's mm -hmm. not going to be a compelling story. Mm -hmm. But if they were spread throughout both theaters, European and Pacific, then I thought maybe we've got something. So I started to examine it, went down to Notre Dame and the other archives, and uh, found out that these chaplains had written letters to their superior at Notre Dame on a, it wasn't a mandatory, like, monthly basis, but, you know, every, every so often. And one guy, Father Barry, did write pretty much every month. And I read some of those letters and found out right away, oh boy, there's a great story here. Um, you know, they were, these guys were at, uh, North Africa, Sicily, Italy, southern France, Normandy. One guy parachuted into Normandy on D-Day, Dachau, uh, the Philippines, and then Death March. Uh, Okinawa, Iwo Jima, they were all over. And so that's how the interest in that story was started. Okay, so uh, why don't we talk about the book then? Tell me how you, how, how do you break it down? Is it by chaplain or chronological? How do you work it out? No, what I, what I did, there were 36 people involved, uh, including, uh, I mean, so, I'm sorry, 35, including six missionaries. They weren't technically chaplains, mm -hmm. but they were on their way to the missions in India when they stopped over in Manila three days before the war broke out. They were trapped and spent the war in prison camp, and so I included them. Mm -hmm. Now, with that kind of a number, you, you, you just can't write a coherent book trying to focus you know, on all of them. And so what I did was I selected four or five and told the story of basically World War II through those four or five. And uh, that way, you know, people who read it can sort of keep things straight. So I started out with how the war started. Mm -hmm. These missionaries uh, actually involved in the first day of combat in the Philippines, which was December 8th in the Philippines on the other side of the international date line. And then I go over to Europe where the chaplains started arriving and then back to the Pacific and so on, always telling it through these few main characters, I'll call them, mm -hmm. even though it's not a fiction book, everything is based on the archive letters and reports and everything else that I uncovered. So that way, you make it manageable for the reader. I do mention every chaplain, especially in an appendix, 
with their picture and where they were stationed and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I just focus on those five or six people. Mm-hmm. How much do these chaplains uh, keep in touch with each other during the war? Or was it all communication through their superior and back, back and forth? Yeah, it was. It was mainly through their superior. <clears throat> they rarely did I find a letter from one chaplain to another. Mm-hmm. It was uh, you know they might meet at a base, a back area of base in the Pacific for a day or so, uh, or if it, two chaplains aboard ships mm-hmm. that pulled into a harbor, they might see each other. But the letters were really non-existent to each other. Mm-hmm. It was mainly through Father Steiner, their superior at Notre Dame. They would say, well, how's Father so-and-so doing? Or have you heard about this person? Mm-hmm. And that's how they sort of kept in contact uh, they, they're they so busy with all of their activities that uh, many of them lack the time to probably uh, put much time into it, though. Mm-hmm. So these guys, I, I found out, were exceptionally busy on the war front. Yeah, I can imagine. So were they all, so how did they break down as far as uh, graduates of Notre Dame who were chaplains versus chaplains for Notre Dame who had been educated elsewhere? They, yeah. They either were uh, the chaplains who became, who were members of the Holy Cross congregation. That's the organization that still operates and runs Notre Dame today. Mm -hmm. Uh, The the, the, uh, uh, congregation of Holy Cross, it's called. They either belonged to that and therefore served on campus in one capacity or another, teacher or whatever. Mm-hmm. Or they were graduates like I am, who after they graduated became priests. Mm-hmm. And those were largely diocesan priests just working. And one was in the Toledo Diocese and worked out of parishes in Ohio. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were only three or four of those. Most of them were the Holy Cross priests. Mm-hmm. So, But they all had that tie to Notre Dame. They all graduated from Notre Dame, as most of the, the congregation of Holy Cross pretty much sends their members to the University of Notre Dame. They live right there and, and get their degree. Mm-hmm. So they all were alumni of the university, but uh, most of them belong to the congregation of Holy Cross. So I saw in the book description there's a, r- a wide range of ages among them. How about um, ra- a range of... Um of rank. Yeah, the oldest was in his early 50s when he started. The youngest would have been upper 20s. And the reason for that is that like soldiers in World War II, a lot of them were 17, even 18, 19. But chaplains had to have gone through the educational process of becoming a priest, mm-hmm. which takes 11 years right there. Uh, time in high school, I'm I'm sick because some of them went to seminary in high school. Mm -hmm. So that's 11 years right there, and then they had to have three years of experience as a priest. So you're talking, they're at least 10 years older than most of the soldiers they served. Mm -hmm. So that's why I see 27, 28 would be the youngest of the chaplains. They average right around mid thirties. Because you know, being a chaplain was tough, and uh, the fifty-one year old uh, had a rough go of it in training camp because mm-hmm. they all went through the same training as uh, the average boots or the average <laughs> marine or anything like that, and, uh, and, um, and so they they had to endure that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it, it could be pretty rough for them. So did they all um, join the military? Well, how did they break down between Army and Navy, or was there any? It really was their preference. Mm-hmm. They would put in, uh, they would first have to ask their superior at Notre Dame permission to enter the military. Mm-hmm. And then they would choose, do I want Army, Navy, etc. Mm-hmm. So 
So it, it, it broke down to there were more Army chaplains than anything. But then again, the proportion of armed forces in World War II was largely Army. Right. Uh, second was Navy, and third was Marines, although Marines were part of the Navy. Right. Although you don't want to tell that to a Marine today. They, they will not <laughs> believe that. Yeah. They claim we're, we're not a part of the Navy. <laughs> we're the Marines. Yeah. But uh, and, and the a chaplain either went to chaplain school for uh, the Army chaplain school or Navy chaplain school. Mm-hmm. They were in different places. The Army chaplain school was mainly at Harvard University and Navy chaplain school at William and Mary University. Hmm. Interesting. So I guess if the, when they did join, that would mean they left sort of a, a, an open or a void of some sort uh, in their their parish. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and that was sort of a quandary for their superior at Notre Dame and other top officials in the the Holy Cross uh, order. How do they replace some of these men? They they needed them to serve in some parishes or teachers at Notre Dame or administrators at Notre Dame. But then they said, "Well, you know, the rest of the country is sacrificing, mm-hmm. and so we've got to do our part as well." Mm-hmm. Um, so they they just made do the best they could. But yeah, it, when you have um, thirty some people removed from whatever their jobs were, it's not always easy to replace that. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they just did the best. But uh, at the same time, hey, we're, we're helping our country. And these chaplains went in in large part because they wanted to do precisely that, mm-hmm. help their country in time of war. And, uh, and so this is giving them the chance to do so. So how many of them were in the front lines and how many, maybe the older ones had more staff positions possibly, you know, organizing other chaplains activities? I'd say two thirds of that number were in the combat zone, the front lines. Mm-hmm. And then the other, obviously the one third would be uh, behind the scenes. And when I say behind the scenes, they might be at bases in the Pacific that had already been taken by the Marines. Uh, or the Army Infantry, mm-hmm. and they were there being chaplains for men stationed at those bases. Mm-hmm. Uh, or they would also take care of Native, Native Islanders. Uh, some were in hospitals on the home front, uh, just one or two. Uh, two. One guy was, I'll say, stuck in Canada. He, he was Canadian by birth, and he became a chaplain in the Canadian Army. But they never let him go overseas, and he, he was pretty ticked off about that. He wanted to get overseas badly, and he kept pestering his superior, help me convince these people, let me get over. But hmm. he never did quite get overseas. Hmm. Interesting. Was he the only, of, of the ones you talk about, was he the only one who wasn't a U.S. citizen? He, yeah, he was the only one who never requested to leave the United States and never went. There were one or two others who, when they were assigned, like the hospital post, mm-hmm. or one guy was assigned in the Caribbean, they, they didn't ask for any transfer to the, uh, the war zone. They just accepted it as their duty. Because mm-hmm. these guys are, again, used to being in the religious life, and when they, your superior tells you to do something, you just do it. And um, and that's what they did. But being human beings, others put up quite a fuss. Uh, I want to get over there. Um, well, Father So and So is in Italy. Why can't I be there? That kind of a thing. Hmm. In, in many ways, these chaplains struck me as every bit of human beings that all of us are. You know, they had the same feelings, emotions, and anger and joy as anything. Mm-hmm. And I use one of them in particular to show that, Father Joseph Barry, mm-hmm. who had an incredible over 500 days in combat in Europe, wow. where he went with the same regiment of the 45th Infantry Division. They were, they were involved in the fighting to take Sicily, 
and over to the Italian mainland, uh, Anzio, Salerno, Monte Cassino, liberated Rome, over to southern France, and into Germany, and ended up at Dachau concentration camp. And his letters blew me away. I mean, this guy, five foot three inches tall, was all Father Barry was, mm. but a dynamo of action. I, I interviewed some of the members, some of the soldiers he served, and unanimously they said, we'll never forget Father Barry. Mm -hmm. In the thick of the fighting with the shells raining down and mortars were exploding near us and bullets nipping at our feet and mud and rain and everything all over, uh, into the ditch uh, slid Father Barry asking us, you guys need anything? <laughs> I mean, he was right there with everything. Mm -hmm. and, and he put all of this into his letters back to his superior. Long letters about uh, what they were experiencing. And never once did I come across in all of his many letters any instance where he called these men soldiers. Mm -hmm. He always said, they're my boys, they're my lads. Mm -hmm. Those are the two phrases. He, he it's almost like he consciously did that because they were boys before the war. Mm -hmm. They entered the military not because they wanted to make it a career, but because they needed to fight for their country. And after that, they returned to civilian life. Mm -hmm. Well, Father Barry thought of them as boys and lads because he wanted to do everything he could so that after the war, they would return as whole and as possibly close to being those same boys mm -hmm. that they were when they entered. An impossible task, obviously, because once you've experienced combat, you, how can you not be changed? But he was determined, he, he's, you know, I want to return them whole and as innocent as possible. Yeah. It was a, a struggle he had all the time. But his letters were, were so powerful. Um, he, he, it would always tell how, you know, Father Steiner, my boys are really suffering this week. And then he'd explain what they went through. Mm -hmm. Never once did he say, oh yeah, I went through all that as well. Because every soldier told me, Father Barry did the same thing we all did. When we were under artillery fire, he was too. And he'd still run out and help someone who was dying and cradle him in his arms and administer last rites. And I said, I don't know how this guy could do it armed only with a Bible and not a rifle. I mean, they just heaped praise after praise on Father Barry. Yeah, I imagine these chaplains, um, in a sense, dealt with more emotional uh, weight on them, more emotional issues than, than the average soldier. They sought it out. Yeah, that's... I agree. That's a great comment. Um, the, um, they sure did, because when you think of it, these guys were men of peace. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're all supposed to be, but you know how that goes. Mm -hmm. uh, but these guys were committed to peace and love and respect for human life. And they're serving in an arena just that opposite of everything. Mm -hmm. death and bloodshed and gore and hatred and that kind of thing and that tore away at some of them Father Barry had a little trouble with that actually uh, nothing major you know he didn't have any problems after the war but he, he, he tried to balance that you know I'm here to help these guys and I'm, I'm serving in, in the most violent arena possible mm -hmm. trying to preach brotherhood and love mm -hmm. and then yeah that would get to them and then these young kids would come up to them with problem after problem after problem. You know, Father, can you do something to help me out? You know, my girlfriend just wrote this Dear John letter. You know, you know hey, we're breaking it off. It's a Dear John letter. Mm -hmm. And how do I handle this? Or, or, or my dad back home is beating my mom. You know, how do I handle that? And I'm across the world from them. So they had to listen to all of the issues the soldiers faced and still try and keep their morale up mm. for the coming combat action, keep the soldiers' morale up, and theirs as well, I'm sure. Mm. Uh, so it was a difficult balancing act of preaching that love and brotherhood in such a violent arena. Mm -hmm. Did Father 
you make any mention of what it felt like to uh, go through Italy, and I don't know if you went through the Vatican or close to it. Yeah, he, Father Gary, um, when they, as they neared Rome, a lot of the soldiers would come up to him and, and ask him, you know, about the Pope and um, stuff like that. And Father Gary wrote in one of the letters back to Father Steiner, uh, is, 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 is the way my boys look at it, all I have to do is go up to the Vatican, knock on the door, and ask, is the Pope in? <laughs> I, I love that comment. It, you know, can the Pope come out and play kind of a thing? <laughs> he said, they all thought that's all I had to do. You know, you know they didn't realize uh, the formality of approaching the Pope. Yeah. Now, he did get a meeting with the Pope, who was Pope Pius XII at that time. Mm-hmm. It was a meeting of maybe 50 chaplains, and the, the uh, Pope gave quite a an emotional talk about how much he appreciated what they were doing. And then went up to each chaplain and said something to, to them, mm-hmm. uh, to Father Barry. You know, he said, oh, I've been to Notre Dame. I enjoyed it very much, that kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. So Father did get to meet him, but uh, not because he knocked on the Pope's front door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, a lot of the letters you don't laugh at or chuckle when you're researching this material, but that was one. <laughs> yeah. Probably the archivist looked up at me and went, Quit laughing, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, but um, it was great to see that comment. But that's, that's what struck me, too, with this. All of these letters, you really get to the humanity, the human angle of combat. Mm-hmm. What these, they're thinking and uh, observing. And most soldiers, when they wrote letters, uh, they just they don't want to worry their parents. And so... They don't get too much into anything. These chaplains didn't have that feeling in their letters to their superior, anyway. Mm-hmm. The letters they wrote home were a different story. But to their superior, they, it was certainly Father Barry and a couple others just unloaded everything. You know, here's, here's what's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, they still could not mention where they were. Uh, the censor would eliminate that. Mm-hmm. But these priests, more accustomed to digging into matters than common soldiers, I suppose, really got into the feelings and the emotions and, and that, that part of the war. Mm-hmm. You get that so clearly. Mm-hmm. I mean, Father Barry at Dachau, another, another powerful moment. Um, but, but every chaplain faced a powerful moment somewhere along the way if they were in the front lines, as two-thirds of them were. Mm-hmm. Did you read any letters um, or anything they, they wrote after the war to get a sense of if they had trouble yeah. reacclimating? Yeah, I did. And no, uh, there was there was one priest who sort of had a, a drinking problem, mm-hmm. um, and um, Father Barry, he because of what he saw, especially at Dachau concentration camp. And it was the first of Hitler's concentration camps. Time magazine said its mere name uh, was um, uh, uh, meant terror throughout uh, Europe. Mm-hmm. And they were the first unit to enter Dachau. The Father Barry's unit liberated Dachau. Mm-hmm. And they were there, and he didn't want to see this stuff. And he said, my gosh, it's, it's too hideous. But he said, no, I have a duty as chaplain, I must see this and record this. Mm-hmm. So he did. He, he tapped one of the inmates at the Dachau as a guide, and he took him through all parts of the camp, including the crematoria and gas chambers and everything. Mm-hmm. And that affected Father Barry. I mean, imagine him staring at a, a, a boxcar packed with bodies of all ages, mm-hmm. you know, just coming out of the gas chambers and he's staring at that it's almost like a man of God staring into the abyss of hell Mm -hmm. and the thoughts that went through his mind as he's doing that Mm -hmm. and it sort of affected him what he needed after the war he he was stationed for a little bit at Notre Dame and then at a high school in Akron, Ohio, Archbishop Hogan High School, a big high school there, and where he worked with 
high school age students, obviously, and that rejuvenated his optimism about youth. He hadn't totally lost it. He never did. But the, the effects of Dachau were sort of cleansed by his experiences after the war. Mm-hmm. So I didn't come across any chaplain who had serious mental issues, uh, just the one with a little bit of drinking. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that would be about it. Hmm. Interesting. So let me ask about the letters uh, that you used. You mentioned the censors. Did you uh, did you read the original versions or did you read the censored versions? Where did no, you know? these these were the originals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the censors tended to leave chaplains a little bit alone. Mm-hmm. The um, they were more concerned about uh, the men in their unit. You know the, the, the privates and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And most of these letters have never been read before. Mm-hmm. And as, as a researcher, you go into archives and you get some of these folders and you know that researchers have been there before because they're disheveled and out of order and, you know, maybe a stain on one letter or something like that. Mm-hmm. But these, it was like, whoa, they're stacked nice and neat, no creases or folded edges or anything. Mm-hmm. And so I'm sitting there thinking, I'm the first guy who's ever read these since World War II. Mm-hmm. And they were all the original, uh, handwritten or typewritten, some of them had access to typewriters, mm-hmm. uh, that were sent to Father Steiner. Mm-hmm. Probably 600 letters at least, maybe 800 for all I know, I never added them up. Mm-hmm. But it, it provided fascinating reading as did some of their reminiscences. Some wrote about their time in war. Mm-hmm. Father Barry gave a long interview. A couple of the missionaries who were in prison camp in the Philippines wrote 90 to 100 typewritten page memoirs of their time at Los Banos, a prisoner camp, mm-hmm. and how they were rescued by paratroopers that dropped into camp to free them because the Japanese were gonna slaughter the whole camp within a day or so. Oh, wow. And so MacArthur ordered a daring parachute drop into the camp, and they rescued every every person, man, woman, and child in Los Banos, which is near Manila in the Philippines, mm-hmm. and whisked them away to safety. It was funny. One of the missionaries, a, a, a brother, he's called, wasn't sure what was going on with all the commotion when these paratroopers were dropping it. I, I, I didn't know what was happening until suddenly I heard one of these soldiers cussing like a good old American. So then I knew I was okay. <laughs> <laughs> so even religious get a, a kick out of cussing, I suppose. <laughs> At least that one did. Yeah. He said, man, I knew these were Americans if they're cussing like that. <laughs> <laughs> so they were all taken to safety. It, it, an amazing raid. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that's why I, I wanted to include these missionaries because of their time in prison camp. Yeah. Uh, two other priests, chaplains in the Philippines, were on the Batan Death March. Father Duffy, an appropriate name for Notre Dame, I guess, in Irish, <laughs> and Father Carberry. And Father Duffy, they were both stationed in the Philippines before the war broke out. Father Duffy was bayoneted by a cruel guard uh, two or three times and left for dead on the trail on the death march. Mm-hmm. But some Filipinos came along and, and, and dragged his body into the jungle and then nursed him back to health. Uh, that he was subsequently captured, spent the rest of the time in prison camp, then was transported to Japan on what, what are called the hell ships. Hmm. And maybe you've heard of those. They, they were called hmm. hell ships. They were transports hmm. taking prisoners from the Philippines to Japan. And they were called that because of the deplorable conditions. A lot of men died on it. Mm-hmm. Well, Father Duffy was in a, the hell ship with Father Carberry, the same uh, hell ship. Mm-hmm. Father Carberry died with Father Duffy, the other Notre Dame priest, administering last rites to him. Yeah. And then they just, the Japanese tossed Father Carberry's body overboard, and that was that. Mm-hmm. Well, Father Duffy survived and made it back to Ohio to serve out his time serve out his time to be a parish priest for the rest of his life. Yeah. 
What other um, resources did he use besides the letters and these memoirs and such? Were there other resources you used for the research? Yeah, the um, uh, at Notre Dame there were four different archives that I used. Mm-hmm. There was one for the main university archives, the one for the Holy Cross priests, a third for the Holy Cross brothers, and then a fourth for the Holy Cross nuns, the two nuns that were in prison camp. After that, I used government records. And, uh, you know, the uh, National Archives or College Park, Maryland, that's where, where you are. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, anymore, you, you can just go on that website called Fold3. Uh, I have a little uh, price for it. It's, it's, it's very inexpensive. I just downloaded all the records that I needed from that. Mm-hmm. The American uh, Army Chaplain Museum in, in uh, South Carolina, Fort Jackson. Mm-hmm. Had some great material uh, on on some of these chaplains. Then the rest would be secondary accounts, like at Los Banos prison camp. There were some really great books written by civilians who were in that camp. Mm-hmm. So I learned about a lot of the life that these chaplains experienced from those books. Mm-hmm. In in Europe, the units that uh, Father Barry and Father Samson. Um, ministered to soldiers wrote their accounts or I called some of them uh, I was able to interview some right, Father Samson the other main chaplain in Europe uh, joined the paratroops the 101st Airborne mm-hmm. and then he found out he was going to have to jump he didn't think a chaplain had to parachute <laughs> so he said I would have never volunteered for that if I had known that well, he went through training camp and did great and then jumped into Normandy on D-Day with, with the 101st. Wow. Uh, had a heck of a first day, June 6th, where he was in a French farmhouse with 14 wounded American soldiers mm-hmm. that surrounded it and captured them. They dragged Father Samson out, lined it up against the wall, and were ready to shoot him. Father Samson later said, you know, I, I knew I was going to die, so I wanted to see the act of contrition, which mm-hmm. in the Catholic faith is, you know, you're sorry for your sins, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. He said, but I couldn't remember the words to the act of contrition, so I said the grace before meals. <laughs> you know, bless us the Lord, these I just kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Well, a German officer ran up and stopped the execution. He, the German officer was a Catholic himself. Mm-hmm. Father Samson went on to then help this other soldier named Pri- uh, excuse me, named Fritz Nyland find his brother. Fritz Nyland jumped into Normandy on D-Day. His brother landed at Normandy on D-Day and was killed that day. Yeah. And Fritz Nyland wanted to find his brother, Richard Nyland. Mm-hmm. So Father Samson went to the cemetery to help him find the grave. And um, Samson came across an island, but the name was Preston Island. And he shouted to this other island, Hey, I, I found an island, but it's not the brother you're looking for. Well, this is a second brother of his who had been killed the day after D-Day. Yeah. Then Private Island learned his third brother, the week before, had been shot down and was missing in the Pacific. Well, Father Samson helped him get home because of the loss of so many from one family. Their family became the basis, in part anyway, for saving Private Ryan. Hmm. Uh, Steven Spielberg used that family as one of five or six hmm. to fashion that particular story. Right. Well, Father Samson then went on to the Battle of the Bulge, where he was captured and spent the rest of the war in a German prison camp. So a lot of these guys and two gals became prisoners of war. Mm-hmm. But you can still, I mean, oddly, a chaplain can still do his work as a POW. Yeah, actually, they, I was going to say they may have had it a little better, but they, they pretty much experienced the same conditions. Uh, they could do their work, but they still suffer from the lack of food and, and beans and you know, Father Duffy was beaten a number of times in prison camp, mm-hmm. and um, they all lost a lot of weight. 
now the, the, the usual story. Yeah. And um, but yes, they could still mostly do what they wanted. In Japanese prison camps, some of their commandants, the crueler ones, would not let them say mass and distribute communion. Mm-hmm. But others allowed that, um, and uh, they, they would use a, maybe a, an eye drop of wine uh, for mass instead of a, a chalice filled with mass, obviously, mm-hmm. filled with wine. And, um, and so they still kept doing their duties as much as they could, and as you know, battling the ravages of disease and whatnot that they as well experienced. Mm-hmm. The, I guess the effects of war that we talked about earlier, you know, the alcohol and, and things, the main effect was that the, the illnesses, they continued to battle for some time after the war because of the poor conditions in prison camp. Mm-hmm. That, uh, they, they just uh, had to keep fighting that. Yeah, I could see that. Did you uh, come across any um, Bibles or crosses or anything that they had or used during the war? The archives has has um, uh, Father Barry's Silver Star, mm-hmm. uh, a Bible that one of the other chaplains used. They had a bunch of photographs. I mean, it was a, I, I was so delighted to come across those. Uh, I had my choice of couple hundred photographs or more than that actually mm-hmm. and, um, and yes but as far as pure artifacts there weren't too many like, like there was one when the paratroopers landed at Los Banos to free those Americans from that Japanese prisoner war camp mm-hmm. one of the paratroopers was from Notre Dame a soldier and he hurriedly wrote a note in pencil to the superior at Notre Dame saying, hey, we just rescued your six missionaries, they're okay, blah, 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 blah. That note is in the archives at Notre Dame. Hmm. Um, a note from Father Duffy when the Japanese forced him to give a radio address. Uh, he had to write out what, the word, what he was going to say. That's in the Toledo Archdiocese archives. Uh, hmm. All of his material is down in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, uh, because that's the diocese he served. So those would be the only artifacts as such. Mm-hmm. So, what did you find most enjoyable about this research? Oh, reading these letters, unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Normally I would say interviewed veterans, but there weren't, none of the chaplains was still alive mm-hmm. when I came across this idea. And, you know, they were 10 years older than soldiers generally. And, um, and normally I would say interviewing, but since they were gone, coming across all these letters and reminiscences, it was like the next best thing to having the person sitting down with you mm-hmm. and saying, here's what it's like. Mm-hmm. So I spent hours reading those and taking notes and enjoying every minute of it. Yeah, just do so it. I'm an archive rat for all my books. I, I could spend hours in an archives and have a blast. Yeah. But this was the most fun of all, uh, this particular project, mm-hmm. because of these letters and photographs, and because it's a story a lot of people don't know. I mean, corpsmen, you know, medical corpsmen, uh, it, it gets some notice, not as much as they should. Mm-hmm. But chaplains tend to be overlooked. Uh, but man, what a job these guys did. I mean, going way back to... to um, uh, you get to go to George Washington or Ulysses S. Grant, um, um, George Marshall. Mm-hmm. They all say a chaplain is worth 20, 30, 40 soldiers because of how much they boost morale. Mm-hmm. They're there to give the soldier hope mm-hmm. that they're going to be okay. Yeah. Even though everyone knows not everyone's going to be okay. Uh, that just the existence of a chaplain boosts a unit's morale. Mm-hmm. And that has been so overlooked, I think, in movies and, and anything. You don't see too much about a chaplain. Uh, and uh, it would be nice if that could change. 
But um, at least this book will bring some notice to this group of chaplains mm-hmm. and, um, and and let people know this, this remarkable role that they played in the war. Mm-hmm. You know, how they, again, how they could keep doing that and, and go out onto a battlefield under fire and ignore the bullets and tend to someone who's dying. Yeah. How you do that? I mean, you, you obviously do. Corbin does that too. Mm-hmm. Boy, oh boy, you know, bullet doesn't know, whoops, that's a chaplain, I can't hit him. Right. So the bullet just goes. And uh, these guys shrugged it off uh, somehow mm. and just did it. Yeah. What did you find that was most surprising in your research? Probably that um, human aspect of it. <laughs> and um, the um, uh, just that they were sort of like the rest of everybody else. And um, and that you know we have our fears and our hopes and our dreams. So do they. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, you know, Father Barry admitted to being scared. He said, "I've got to go up to the front tonight. Mm-hmm. I've got to. Uh, it's ten o'clock, and my boys need me up there. So I'm scared, but we, you know, I've got to do it. Mm-hmm. And then the universal mention." by every chaplain from Notre Dame of how things on campus. They always ask about things on campus, like, you know, the Golden Dome, but the uh, the grotto, a religious place there, the beautiful lakes, there's two small lakes on campus. And every one of them always asks, and how's the football team doing? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every single one. Oh, it's somewhere in there. Hey, did, did the Irish beat Michigan, or did the Irish do this? Or uh, hey, I, my I, my my soldiers are teasing me. We got beat by whoever. Uh, that that kind of thing. <laughs> so I thought, yeah, they're just like all the rest of us. I'm always wondering how Notre Dame is doing, or our favorite college for me is Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they followed sports, and they worried about their parents. Uh, you know, what, what will my parents? be thinking of me being here on the battlefield uh, how is this affecting mom and the dad that kind of thing mm-hmm. so you know sometimes maybe we, we think of religious people in any faith not just the Catholic faith as somehow apart from us mm-hmm. but they're not right. they're the same they're, they're just like everyone else they just have a different job mm-hmm. and a story and, and, and that I guess is what Maybe surprises with the word. It, it, it really struck me, though, and I, when I thought about it, I thought, "Yeah, it makes sense that they would be that way." Mm-hmm. So the, the, the humanness angle of a chaplain, of a religious person, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like one of the nuns in prison camp, she was as feisty a character as you could have. Huh. Uh, she didn't take anything, from, you know, from Japanese. She one back down and um, you know she was a real pistol mm. and I got a, a charge out of that mm-hmm. so those, those would be the, the, the bigger surprises I suppose Was there a particular uh, issue you were trying to get an answer for that just took a, a little while maybe more than most or something that you, you still would like to know that you didn't figure out Not, not really no um I would have loved to have been able to ask these people directly a few questions mm-hmm. that I, I couldn't uh, get from letters, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Because Father Barry pretty much answered everything, you know, how you feel about this and how you feel about that. But most of them didn't get as deep as he did. Mm-hmm. They were very perfunctory letters, some of the chaplains. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would like to ask them some uh, about some other issues as well. Mm-hmm. And um, maybe uh, ask us specifically: Did you experience post-traumatic stress disorder of some sort? Mm-hmm. Uh, but because um, that obviously didn't come out, so that, that would be the only thing. But everything else, you know, just sort of answered itself as you go through research. And I didn't have a preset list of questions. I hope to have answered. I just okay, let's. See where this journey takes us. You know what, what path will I go along on this? 
mm-hmm. let the story write itself in that way. Interesting. With all the World War II footage out there, I wonder if any of it caught um, any of them in the field. It just no one was able to identify who you know. Where's that priest from? Who is he? You know, I wonder if that's out there. Well, I'm sure it is, but I wonder if uh, how much. By, it, by who is that? Well, I'm not. I don't follow that question. Oh, you know. just you know, newspapers taking footage. You know, journalists taking footage of people on the front lines and jur- oh, okay, or not on the front lines necessarily, but maybe in the rear. You know, catching footage of them. You know, because there's yeah. always footage out there, and a lot of people aren't identified. You know, in it. Right. Right. So, and unfortunately, I was able to get enough pictures where uh, they are identified. Mm-hmm. of some of these chaplains, uh, including Father Barry, say in mass in a field mm-hmm. or on the hood of a jeep, hearing confessions. The picture on the front of the books is of Father Dupuy in Saipan uh, hearing the confessions of, of Marines. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you, there are no pictures of them under fire as such. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there, are, there aren't, that, you know, other than a documentary of some sort, Mm-hmm. There are not many pictures of infantry under fire, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But no, you're, you're right. It's certainly not on, on the priests that I came across anyway. Because it makes me want, you know, when you read such intimate uh, thoughts of these people, um, it just makes me wonder, you know, curious to see them in motion, you know, if they did video interviews later or anything like that. You know what I'm saying? Just seeing that. Oh, yeah. No, I, I didn't come across any. That would have been fun, yeah. I came across interviews, but they were all in print form. Mm-hmm. And nothing where I saw anything or heard anyone's voice. Um, yeah, that, that would have been special. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was just curious about that. Um, sure. Was there... So you mentioned a number of things that emotionally moved you. Um, is there any other... other uh, stories or incidents that moved you strongly either positively or negatively? Um, well, positively, the, the um, one time when um, Father Barry, again, this is in Italy, uh, the night before the men were to go into battle, this one soldier came up to talk to Father Barry alone. And he said, you know, Father, I'm, um, I'm going to go into action tomorrow. And he said, I'm not afraid of dying. He said, I just want to be able to have someone tell my parents if I do die that I was a good soldier, that I did my duty. He said, I, I, and, and he talked for a long time about that, you know, what it meant for the soldier to do his duty. And, and Father Barry basically just listened he said, I didn't try and talk him out of it. I said, ah, you'll be okay. So the soldiers know the story. Mm-hmm. They know you're just going to be giving them a line if, if you do that. And so I just let him talk. And uh, and then he said, you know, you just go and, and, and do what you think you're supposed to do. And they, they left it at that. Well, the next day, the battle happened, and the soldier was mortally uh, wounded. Mm-hmm. Father Barry was at his side holding him in his arms as his soldier was dying and with you know battle still raging about him Father Barry whispered in this soldier's ear remember what we talked about last night well here it is and I can say you were a good soldier that struck me uh, I mean that affected me you know a priest in the midst of battle whispering that into a dying soldier's ear, you were a good soldier. I don't know if it, but for some reason that really uh, got to me. Mm-hmm. And so I certainly included that in uh, the book. Mm-hmm. The um, the part where the one chaplain was giving last rest to the other nerd named chaplain on the hell ship mm-hmm. was powerful as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, there were a lot of little episodes that were touching in the way they they were thinking of the, the soldiers trying to maybe get a birthday cake for them at, uh, on the wartime front, you know, if they could. 
uh, find a local Italian family who would make a rudimentary cake for a soldier uh, who Father Barry thought really needed it to boost his morale. Hmm. Uh, those were the touching moments. Father Burke, who was aboard the battleship Pennsylvania when just a few days before the war ended in August of 1945, his ship was hit by a Japanese torpedo, killed 20-some men. Mm -hmm. Well, the letters that he had to write home, as you say, he made copies of them. Those are all in the archives. Those were quite powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, how do, how do I write this? Because every chaplain went through that feeling. Uh, that was maybe their, their hardest job. How do I write the families of those who died? What do I say to them? Mm -hmm. And am I doing any good with these letters? Well, he composed a uh, study. He, he had a, an introductory paragraph and a closing paragraph that was largely the same in all the letters. But in the middle is where he personalized it for each man who died. Uh, just to give them some, their families, some kind of information. And he received replies to those where the families said we're so grateful that you took time to write us and to know that our son had a religious person celebrating a mass, saying a mass in his honor, or that a, a chaplain was with him when he died, that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. now, those were powerful moments as well. So you mentioned uh, some of what you hope the book will do, you know, make people more aware of the, the sacrifices and efforts of these chaplains. Um, can you expand on that or maybe discuss other things you'd like to see uh, come out of this book for readers? Yeah, the, the, the sacrifices, I mean, these guys were used to sacrifice. You know, the religious life is a pretty tough life. Mm -hmm. And the Congregation of Holy Cross is a religious community, so they take a vow of poverty and uh, therefore technically do not own anything. Uh, they, they sacrificed a great deal before the war, and this added to it, mm -hmm. uh, where they, they didn't have much money to do anything. If they needed some, they had to write their superior for permission for a few extra bucks, that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so the sacrifice from missing their families, their, their parents, their sisters, and, and things like that, they sacrificed just as much as the infantry or sailors did. It's just they weren't married, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in so many ways, they were like a, a, a soldier who wasn't married. Mm -hmm. The soldier's job was to fight. The, the chaplain's job was to tend to those men who fought. And so they, again, the normalcy of the chaplain, uh, the, the hum, human of the chaplain and um, so again it was the humanness of it all uh, that, that just made itself so evident to me as I dug deeper and deeper into the story so can you talk to any difficulties you had in finishing the book or and or getting it published and how you overcame those um, no everything went smoothly uh, I went to Notre Dame Press and they were delighted to have it mm -hmm. um, the um a chaplain book is again something that's different mm -hmm. than most books about World War II or any conflict. There aren't that many out there like this. Mm -hmm. There, there were more than I thought, I, I suppose. But that's when you count all the wars together. Mm -hmm. But something like this is, is totally, I think, unique. Mm -hmm. And so Notre Dame Press was happy to have it mm -hmm. because it's about Notre Dame people. Right. And um, about an angle that has not been covered at all. So there were there were no issues in lining them up as a publisher, and uh, no permission issues in any way. Um, uh, it was a smooth uh, a project, I guess, as, as as you could foresee. Although I generally haven't encountered many problems in in any of my projects, any of my books. Mm -hmm. The um, if you have a good story, publishers will take a look at it. Mm -hmm. And once you get one published, then they're more apt to take a look at your second and third and fourth ideas, etc. Mm -hmm. 
So it was it was a very easy one. The um, it took a while only because I I was doing some other books at the same time with major publishers like the Copple Press or Penguin or whatever. Mm-hmm. And those were the books where you, you, you get a, a decent advance and things like that. With a university press, you're not going to get that. Mm-hmm. And so I would do that sort of in my spare time um, and go back to campus and, and, and do the uh, research. So it took a little bit longer than normal, but um, that was no problem for me because it was so much of a, a fun story to work with. Mm-hmm. What's your next writing project? I'm just finishing up. It's due Halloween, actually. It's a, a, a the, the tentative title is Last Dogfight Over Tokyo. Hmm. I don't know if they're going to keep that title or not. But it's a book about the last four guys to die in World War II. Hmm. They were naval aviators flying off the aircraft carrier Yorktown off the coast of Japan in July and August of 1945. And as the, the war neared its end, especially after the atom bombs were dropped, these pilots, they didn't want to go up on any more missions. You know, they knew the war was going to end. We dropped a couple atom bombs. It was just a matter of time before Japan capitulated. And yet they kept being ordered out on more missions. Mm-hmm. Well, on the last day of the war, August 15th, this one group of fighters from the carrier Yorktown took off to toward the targets near Tokyo. They were over the targets when they got the call back from the carrier, hey, abort, come back to the carrier, the war is over. So they turned around and were on their way back to the Yorktown when Japanese fighters jumped them and shot down four of the guys uh, and then and, and they died. And so <clears throat> technically they took off from the carrier in wartime but were shot down in peacetime because mm-hmm. the Japanese had agreed to surrender while they were over Tokyo. Mm-hmm. So that's why we're calling them the last four men to die in the war. It was the last mission, a wartime mission, where people were killed. Mm-hmm. Now, there's certainly many thousands of men who died in the decades after the war mm-hmm. as a result of their wounds from the war. Right. And so they are obviously World War II casualties. But this is an actual wartime mission and people who died in it. This was the last one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow. So that's that's a fascinating one, too. So wow. I'll be uh, in that in in October and uh, get through the process of getting that published for next year. I think spring of next year is what they plan. Okay. So where can people find your books and uh, your writings if you happen to have social media presence or anything? Yeah, they they can go to my website, which is johnwookowitz dot com. You know, my name dot com, and they can order any books there. They can go to Amazon and order any of my books, mm-hmm. Barnes and Noble dot com, mm-hmm. um, the, the actual bookstores. Uh, although the, the, that numbers that number is declining as we speak, I suppose. Yeah. The um, so any of the normal outlets, Notre Dame Press would have it. Mm-hmm. If they want to inscribe copies, they should just go to my website and uh, uh, they can order any one of my books. There's a page that I have that has all the books and they just send me a message with which book and to whom to inscribe the book and we'll take it from there. Okay. And just, I'll spell your name, J-O-H-N-W-U-K-O-V-I-T-S, Correct. That's correct, yeah, that's right. Dot com. Um, yeah, that'll do it. So that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts? No, that was great. Very uh, extensive interview. Fantastic questions. I, I had a blast doing it. Okay, yeah, so did I. Thank you. Thank you for listening. One of the best ways to provide feedback on this podcast is to rate it on iTunes. Please let me know if you liked it. Or give me a poor rating if you didn't like this podcast, and I can use that feedback to hopefully get better. Otherwise, please follow me on Instagram at Chris Alvarez War Scholar, 
on YouTube under War Scholar 1945, on Twitter at War Scholar, on Facebook under War Scholar, and you can find more information on my website, warscholar.org. Please remember my name, Chris, does not have an H, so it's C R I S A L V A R E Z. Thank you, and I hope you continue to enjoy this podcast.